Hello muffins, here is a video all about the pale man what? sequence in Pan's Labyrinth. So, hello from me and Buster. He's going to be here for as long as he can stand it. Um, this might be in two parts depending on how um, in on how long it's going to take me. Um, so this is for A-level film studies, um, global cinema, section A of your component two exam. Oh, there we go. See, I told you you wouldn't stay there, put there very long. Right. <clears throat> so I am. A, I have a bit of a cold today, so um, I've got my tissues. I'm going to stay hydrated and um, let's get going with this. Now, this is a really big scene. Um, we focus a lot of our energies um, in my class on this scene. It's so full of, of content. Remember, with all these videos, um, I'm just like giving you some observations, some things you can say about this particular scene. Every single person, when they watch these scenes, everyone has a different interpretation. You might see different things. Um, this is some of the things that my class and I have picked up over a few years of studying so we are actually going to begin here. Just, I think it's quite handy for some to know comes for it. And um, this is a little bit of gore comes before it. So if you remember um, the quote from Del Toro that Ophelia's fantasy is just as brutal as her reality. So I think it's quite poignant that we have this. He's about to, we don't see it. It's all in our heads. Um, we, we're about to not see um someone's leg being amputated and it's all in the edit it's all in what we don't see that shock and we have like a shock and then we're going to go into the scene so the scene kind of like starts with sort of like recovering from a moment of violence Un momento. See, we don't see anything. It's all in the sound. It's all in the edit. Now, here we go. The beginning of our scene. We look at this. This is what we call the aesthetic of reality. It's cold, dark blues. And here we go. The Book of Crossroads. Essentially, um, a book full of mythology that she follows. It's kind of like her, her uh, religious text, her Bible, if you like. She's following these rules that the, that the book is telling her. And as you can see there, we've got the, the image of the pale man coming out. And it's a very yonic image. As you see those circles creating that yonic shape that her fantasy world is filled with. So this book of Crossroads is about a turning point in Ophelia's life. She's going from childhood to adulthood. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a coincidence that we have lots of blood and symbols of the female going through this film because this is a, a coming of age story yes yeah, set against the backdrop of war but it's a female coming of age story so the the fantasy elements are especially packed with these yonic kind of images and we've got this idea that she's the princess of the moon she's got the little moon symbol on her or creating sort of like links and connotations to this lunar cycle Chalk is a key prop. It unlocks the fantasy world. Look at this. Now that, oh, I paused it too late. But um, that moment there where we have that long shot of her room, it reminds me very much of German expressionism. Um, those of you that um, watched Cabinet of Dr. Calgary with me um, for our study of spies, German expressionism. We've got those angular lines. We've got the disjointed frame, all to connote that her reality is something not quite right. Una vez abierta la puerta, inicia el reloj de arena. The hourglass, as well. It's kind of a, a nod, if you like, to. Um, Wizard of Oz, and this idea of the hourglass, and this idea that time is running out. So her time um, as uh, a child is running out. Um, very soon, Ophelia is going to have to start to take her role as a woman in society. Now, we think about context in this particular era, Spain in the 1940s, um, 
it is, and we can see that through the characters of her mother, especially, um, and the characters of Mercedes. These are these are female characters that have to sacrifice to give up a lot, um, and they, neither of the female characters appear to be um, living the lives that they would like, and they have to fight really hard for every little thing, and their lives are, are brutal and violent and you know, if you're seeing that through the eyes of Ophelia, this young girl, then we see these really, I think Carmen is a strong character. People do argue with me about that. But if you think about Carmen's character and what she goes through and what she's had to sacrifice for her daughter, um, she has got, I hate this word, but strong female sort of like role models around her. But all the same, this idea of like going into womanhood in this era would have been and still is quite scary. So, with all good fairy tales, you have the rule of three. Three rules that she must follow. She's going to break them all. This is a lovely moment. Ready? I wanted just to let that play out. So, we have this. The camera pulls back. It tracks back. And parallel with that, we also have this... Uh, rattly kind of like intake of breath uh, it's as if this um place that she's going into just like with the toad task this place is alive in some way look we have fleshy colored walls that are kind of like red and sticky and drippy so we've got flesh walls it's breathing it's as if she's sort of like awakened this ancient evil with that slow ancient sounding intake of breath so I think that's really interesting how del Toro has made this location have its own sense of agency its own desires its own needs camera pulls back makes her look very small and insignificant and I think this is a very interesting shot here so she's in terms of the framing she's now a tiny little speck like and she's small in comparison to this huge problem before her. And I always think that these pillars here look like ribs and the, f the walls look like flesh. So what we've got here, we've got these kind of like internal organs. Now that could have lots and lots of connotations. A couple that I talk about with my class are um, connotation number one. And that is that she's entering into what we call the belly of the beast, the layer of the beast. So she's entering into this sort of liminal space where um, like these ancient demons and sins live. And we all have these like spaces inside us, in our souls. It's called the shadow self, this darkness inside us all. So she is now entering this layer. We call it the belly of the beast. And um, another sort of like connotation you could have is that she's returning to the mother. She's returning to the womb and that this is a female space that she's now entering. Um, so she's desperately trying to cling on to her childhood and she's now returning to the mother. Another thing that this particular, uh, now I paused here, strikes me. You see the lights coming down. It looks a little like a prison as well here. Um, those lights coming down from the ceiling look kind of like a modern in some ways, looks like a prison. I think I just muted while I was blowing my nose. Apologies. <clears throat> Here we go. See how the camera is really fluid in this scene. It um, it's sort of like always sort of like the camera is sort of like moving forwards and backwards, sort of like encircling her. And here we go. Now we see this layer. We're going to get a good look at several um, areas that are important in this layer in a moment. But this is the establishing shot. And what we can see immediately, this is what the lighting is highlighting, is that 
anthropomorphic, which means it's kind of like got a face, that fireplace. See, it's kind of like looking like a snarling kind of like mouth with the, um, the teeth and it's got eyes. Um, we have the checkerboard floor, like a chess game that is being played here. And in the corners, we see these piles of shoes, more on that later. We see lit to the side there, to that side, like the, the, the three little doors. And then we have this dome shape um, above the table, which is very, very um, reminiscent of a church or a cathedral. Now, I think that's really, really interesting. So this is a layer of this kind of like darkness this monster but it looks like a church is del toro saying here that the the church is the monster with all this religious iconography that we have in this scene another thing we have in this scene that's religious iconography is this magnificent feast looks kind of like the, a painting called the last supper and another thing oh, sorry i'm sniffy now another thing we have here is we have the pale man sat exactly where Captain Vidal was sat in the banquet scene, um, which is the parallel scene to this, which I encourage you very much to go back and review. Um, he is sat where Captain Vidal was sat. So there's a really obvious parallel here, the pale man, Captain Vidal, both these monstrous, these monstrous figures in Ophelia's life. Can you see... Oh, so it's see, can you hear how we have this breathing <gasps> going all the way through this scene? Um, so it's as if this place is alive. Now, I, I do quite think this shot is interesting. The camera sort of like follows her. Uh, it's almost as if the camera is stalking her, as if she is the prey and the camera is the predator. So remember, the camera is us. The camera is our perspective. So we are kind of like watching her, stalking her. Um, are we afraid for her? Are we, um, do we pity her? Um, are we waiting for her to, to do something wrong? And here we go. This is the temptation. So we've got all red and gold in here. Those are the colours of the Spanish flag. So this is both patriotic colours, but also incredibly rich and vibrant colours. But also, again, that colour of blood that color of danger and the blood in this coming of age story this female coming of age story is all again about what we've spoken about in class this idea of menstruation and these ionic symbols that we get in the film see the kind of tracking prowling all around fixed on her there's a really subtle sound effect there like a Whom! It's as if all the air is sucked out of the room as soon as she sees the pale man. Now, um, Doug Jones um, is a brilliant creature actor um, and he is I think having the time of his life playing a character like, um, like the pale man. Um, we want to observe when we're watching this scene the intricacies of his performance the pale man is this ancient beast but th the sound effects really help here the the foley sound effects when he moves he has the sounds of sharpening knives and breaking branches kind of like that um modern and metallic sound but that ancient kind of like um sound of like trees and things like that and his movements are very staccato which means like jagged and it's very animalistic in terms of his performance here and we've got this performance really juxtaposing the child as well the ancient evil and the child the design of the pale man is very interesting Let's get a good look at him here um he has got like the saggy skin all over as if he was once this this something bigger something different something larger and maybe he's going through like a, a cocoon like phase as if he's going to emerge something else later um it is, his design is kind of like fetal or phallic as well um and let's not forget that he is if we're going into this female space he is in excuse me i'm gonna cough Uh, 
I really hope the mute worked then. Sorry. <clears throat> so he's... Oh, no, again. Okay, I think that's it. Oh, I, huh. I forgot where I was, but we'll keep going from this point. <clears throat> On the plate, we have the two eyes. Um, this is a um, symbol of Saint Lucia, and she um, sacrificed herself. She was a martyr. So this is quite an interesting symbol to put here with this monster, um, because I've got to blow my nose now. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> right, so we have these symbols of this religious um, martyr. Now, what I think is really interesting and what makes the, the pale man such an interesting figure to study is because um, Del Toro said that he wants us to see, um, he, he wants to be friends with monsters. You know, he, he, he wants us to see something within this monster that is pitiable, something to, in this monster that we can emote with, that we can connect with. This isn't a monster that is just out and out fearsome. There's layers here. Um, some of the um, sound effects we have are like crying animals, screaming animals, and that's uh, the sound of fear coming out of him. So, um, he also based this particular monster on a um, a painting um, by Goya called Saturn Devouring His Son that I suggest you look at. And, um, and he said he looked at that painting and he saw the pain and anguish, pain and anguish of the monster. So he is not unsympathetic towards monsters um, and he wants us to see that too. So I think that might be why we have some of these symbols here and some of these sounds that um, are about something else other than fear. So here we have a symbol of a martyr. And he's going to put them in his hands as well, the eyes. And that's a stigmata. So that's a, that's a, um, a, a, a Christian belief that um, Jesus was nailed to the cross. And so it's called that having cuts on the hands was like a symbol of being a martyr. And that's where he puts these things. So there's lots of religious imagery here surrounding this monster is he saying that religion is the monster sounds of children crying and then here we have frescoes that's what we call paintings on the ceilings of these fine cathedrals and chapels and these all appear to be things celebrating the pale man um, and we see him like as this maybe like Old Testament kind of like um, force, um, uh, like wrath, I would say, like killing these children in those pictures. But at the same time, that is a symbol of worship. So lots of um, cross um, cross percolating of ideas here with um, Catholicism. And here we go. So we have ideas all about images of Catholicism. And then this is a lovely shallow focus shot here. We know this image. We've seen it um, in, image, in um, images of um, concentration camps, the piles of um, belongings um, from Jews and others that were um, massacred in that holocaust and so we recognize this pile of shoes we've got the sound of the screaming children we're now seeing the scale of this monster's destruction and it's a very clever use of shorthand here um what another thing i love about this scene is, is there's no dialogue it's almost completely silent and um it's all told with the images. This is called pure cinema. We have just images telling the story for us here. And that's a lovely little focus throw. So it goes low angle, looking up at her, a little focus throw um, towards her, focused on the shoes and then on her. This reminds me a little bit of Labyrinth this bit. Now, all good heroes have to break the rules. Yeah. Is 
sister. Did you notice there that the key prop stings? Sing! And the knife as well, when she gets that out and she looks at it, that's going to sing! That high pitched ringing that is going to alert you to the fact that this is a key item. And in the real world, And in the real world, the key and the, um, the shaving knife, they zing, they have that metallic singing sound as well. Ah, no. Do you hear that circular motion starting in the sound, in, within the soundtrack? And the harps and the motion here, the camera. So we have that, that very fluid push into her face and the harp. Do -do 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 -do. It's as if she's been put under a spell. She takes the grape, the symbol of original sin. Um, um, um. So she is Eve in this kind of like allegory now. So she sins, she breaks the rules, she eats the grape, and then she unleashes this wrathful beast on the world. a lovely little focus throw there so a focus right there we were focused on Ophelia's face and then as she turns it makes it feel like a point of view shot but it's not quite she checks the beast he is still there that's a focus throw and then a focus pull back oh that's a delicious looking grape but to be fair so what I love at that moment is the camera just kind of abandons her. It's as if the camera has more agency and awareness of what's happening than she does. So the camera travels over her shoulder and then we cut to the beast awakening. So I love the sounds in this moment. We have knives. We have tree branches. I mean, the foley here is amazing. We have, like, I think we can hear, like, a rattlesnake type of sound. Um, and we can hear all these animal sounds as well. We have the sounds of predators, but we also have the sounds of prey. We have, I, th I think, pigs screaming as well in this moment as well. So lots of sounds here that give connotations of predator and prey that surround the pale man. And his performance here, I love this little, like spiders, this where he's like waking up and his movement just feels so extraordinary and so alien. And it's that movement that makes him quite fearsome, I think. Two grapes, two fairies that get eaten, I think. Well, I mean, yes, the monster is terrifying, but as well, it's so frail as well and ancient. It's like this um, this ancient evil, this wrath that is like, again, again, in our shadow self. It's in all of us. This, um, this like darkness inside has been awakened. Is that part of growing up? Is that part of this journey into womanhood that um, the sin, you know, is going to follow her? Now we've got a, 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 a come on, Laura, use your words. We've got a lovely segment here of the chase where we cross cut between her running and the uh, monster running. Um, we then see her feet running, and then we see his frail, ancient little feet stumbling along as well. And it cross cuts between the two to give us this sense of urgency.
so he's kind of like got a military salute there and that's also where we hear the screaming coming like um pigs screaming and we can really see here like the design of this particular monster um he's it's so interesting isn't it this idea that he's 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 blind kind of and then we have all this pale you know this pale flesh he kind of looks all like a corpse or a zombie already um and i really like when we cross cut back to his little feet walking along ah uh, so here we have the the, the sound of the sand flowing through the, the hourglass there is amplified and that's a lovely focus push um, so we go from shallow focus on the hourglass to her just a little reminder there that time is running out So her colours are the blue of the outside world. She does look very, what we would consider to be images of Anne Frank in this particular moment here. Look, there he goes, he's so slow. And then you cut to her feet. Oh, beautifully done. And the tweeting sound of the fairy. Amplifying, we have the heartbeat going through the music. Heartbeat continues. And then the sound of the monster turns into the sounds of the house. Is the house the monster? beautiful little full stop on that scene what a beautiful little touch just a little squeak of the fairy on her shoulder Beep. and that is the end of the scene we're back into the aesthetic of realism now we're out of the aesthetic of fantasy and it is dark low-key lighting blue gunmetal gray blue cold stark contrast there to the aesthetic of reality that we see in um the pale man sorry the aesthetic of fantasy in the pale man scene which is all reds and golds uh, great juxtaposition between the cold blues. Uh, uh, yeah, just look at that window behind her, that circular window with the, uh, I think it's a plant growing across it or something like that. It looks very, very German expressionist. Um, right, uh, my apologies for my stinking, stinking, horrible cold. Um, I really hope the mute button worked when I was coughing and blowing my nose today. Um, hopefully you'll find this uh, little video helpful in the run-up to your exam. Good luck, and uh, and I'll uh, see you later, Muffin. Bye. Switch it off. Okay. Bye, Muffins. <laughs>